Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Benjamin Lee, and uh, I want to just uh, thank and thank um, our uh, panel and everyone for coming um, to this course, uh, number 68, Surgical and Medical Management of High-Risk Renal Cell Carcinoma, New Paradigms for Treatment. I am, uh, the, uh, I am at the University of Arizona, chair of the Department of Urology. Our esteemed panel uh, today, Dr. Oliver Sartor, Professor of Medicine and Urology and the Associate Dean for Oncology at Tulane University Medical School, as well as Dr. Chandru Sandaram, the Welsh Professor of Urology, Vice Chair and Program Director at Indiana University Department of Urology. We have a few housekeeping items just to begin um, that uh, this, just let everyone know that this course utilizes audience response questions and then to participate, you need to log in to Poll Everywhere um, and if we could bring up that uh, website address, the poll EV AUA meeting 18, and if one can text um, to, uh, in the address, it's 22333, and if you could text the phrase um, AUA meeting 818, then um, you will join uh, the audience response system, um, polleverywhere.com. So the, um, the AUA 2022 annual meeting mobile app is available and is free to download. And when you download the app, you'll be um, asked for a username and password. Um, and the password is your AUA ID that you can find on your, your registration badge. Um, the policy states that all um, planners, authors, and presenters um, disclose prior to um, presentation financial relationships. Please silence your cell phones. Um, no photos, video, or audio recordings are permitted. The course are selected based on evaluation results. And then for every course evaluation that you complete, you'll, your name will be entered in a drawing for complimentary registration and look forward to seeing everyone next year in um, Chicago. We're gonna um, start with some, uh, some test questions. If we can go to the next slide. And a sample test question. Uh, what do you love uh, most about uh, New Orleans? A, the um, AUA, of course. B, Creole and Cajun food. Um, C, Bourbon uh, Street. Or uh, um, D, the French Quarter. So I'm going to turn things over as people vote to Dr. Sartor, who will um, then read our um, pretest questions for this course. First of all, I want to say thank you to Ben for putting the course together. Pleasure to be here again. And uh, welcome to New Orleans. Happens to be where I live, so I didn't have to travel too far to get here. So we have a couple of pretest questions. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, just give her a second. Oh, give her a second. Okay. Let me know when you're ready to start. By the way, I didn't see the answer to the initial one. I suspect it was the food. It could have been Bourbon Street, it could have been the French Quarter, but I suspect it was the food. You ready to go? All right, a couple of pretest questions. Number one, we're going to talk about in patients with high risk renal cell carcinoma, adjuvant therapy, pembrolizumab results in A, no reduction in risk of recurrence, B, unacceptable toxicity, or C, reduction in risk of recurrence or death by about 32%. And so you record your answer. I 
And are we going to look at the results? We no? Advance one more. Uh, we, we advance one more, okay. And this, in the setting of adjuvant targeted therapy with TKI inhibition with sunitinib, with clear cell RCC, how long was the improvement in disease-free survival? Three, six months, one year, or five years? And she's going to bring it up, I think, and then you get to vote for A, B, C, or D. And then I'll come on to the next slide. In the setting of metastatic RCC, what options should be included in the discussion for goals of treatment? Resect the primary tumor, resect the metastases, or all of the above? And with that, we'll come up to pretest question number four. There are several risk stratifications that are used for metastatic renal cell, and which of these are included except? So performance status, calcium, time from diagnosis to treatment, WBCs or LDH. One of those is not correct. Which one would it be? With that, we'll start on our update on advanced in metastatic renal cell. Now, it turns out that I'm going to be talking about late stage disease, but I'm going first. Usually, the late stage guy goes last, so I'm very unaccustomed to being the lead off hitter in renal cell when we have the localized disease to follow. That being said, um, I'm going to talk about six areas of focus for today. I'm going to talk a little bit about classification and genomics, a little bit about adjuvant treatment, the role of surgery in metastatic disease, first-line therapy, second-line therapy, and then some non-clear cell discussions. So six areas that we're going to have a little focus on, all done in 30 minutes, and hopefully then we'll move on to others. So first of all, Kidney cancer heterogeneity. Well, it's real. You know, we talk about kidney cancer, and most of the time what we're really referring to is clear cell. And that's going to be somewhere around 75% of the cases, but there's a whole lot more of the story. So everybody, I think, is familiar with the papillaries, papillary type 1 and type 2, two different types of papillary, chromophobes, oncocytomas, hybrids, we can talk about the angiomyolipomas, the clears chromophobes, medullary, the mixed tumors, the mest, and then of course papillary epithelioid, which is pretty rare. So we're dealing with a whole variety, and one of the first things that you need to do is understand what type of renal cell you're talking about. The assumption is it's going to be clear cell, but it's not always true. Now, one of the things that's been interesting, and this has been evolving really over the last decade, is that there are a whole series of genetic alterations linked to these particular subtypes. And VHL is the one that is linked most specifically to clear cell. And uh, by the way, just a little bit of shout out to a urologist that I really admire, Marston Linehan. Marston Linehan has worked underlying these different types of kidney cancer genes, different types of kidney cancer syndromes, familial syndromes, and has done an absolutely fantastic job. And through his work, and of course others, we now understand that things like papillary type 1 is associated with MET alterations. And chromophobes, hybrid oncocytomas are associated with folliculin alterations. And fumarate hydratase is part of papillary type 2. And for papillary epithelioid, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Angiomyolipomas, it's actually TSC 1 and 2. And then as we move on to things like clear and chromophobe, it's P10. 
and medullaries is SMARC B1 and MEST is CDC 73. And this sort of molecular classification is now, I think, helping us in the histologic classification because at times I think everybody knows you go to the pathologist and they end up a little bit confused. But now we can get more and more genetic classification and that helps. Now, I'm not gonna talk a lot about hereditary renal cancer syndromes. If I were Marcia Linehan, I could do that, but uh, I'm Oliver Sarter, and we're just gonna mention von Hippel Landau, and that's the VHL gene, and that's the one that's most well known. The hereditary leiomyomatosis <laughs> and renal cell cancers are caused by pathogenic variants and fumarate hydratase, and yes, you can actually see these. Um, I've seen them in our clinics. And the Bert Hogg debay is caused by the pathogenic variants in folliculin. Hereditary papillary renal cell by pathogenic variants in MET. So these familial cancer syndromes do have a genetic basis and they're now teased apart. One of the things that's a little bit interesting is now understanding to a greater degree the germline variation that we see in pathogenic findings associated with renal cell carcinoma. This was an article uh, with uh, senior author Tony Schwery. I think everybody knows Tony up at uh, Dana Farber. And he looked at this trans ethnic variation at, as a lead off, which I thought was really, really good. And he had a couple of interesting things that he found. Uh, first of all, he found that about 17% of patients with renal cell carry a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in their germline. And that's probably something that was not really appreciated very well before. And what was interesting is that things like fumarate hydratase were actually more common in patients of African ancestry. Check two, pathogenic, likely pathogenic, is more common in patients of non-African ancestry. And the patients with non-African ancestry were actually more likely to have an actionable mutation. So this was sort of interesting. Here's sort of the list of findings um, and goes from top to bottom, things like check 2 loss of function, fumarate hydratase. I mean, TYH, I'm not really sure if it's pathogenic or not. Probably not in my estimation. It can just be a, be a carrier gene. BRCA2, 1.3% of patients with real cell have BRCA2. That was a bit of a surprise to me. ATM, folliculin, check 2s, and more. So we're doing a fair amount of germline testing now in our renal cells. And it's been an interesting sort of odyssey, finding things that we did not really know a lot about beforehand. Now, adjuvant therapy, moving on to the next part. I think we have a new standard of care, FDA approved on November 27th of, of last year, uh, very importantly. And this was the New England Journal. And again, I'm gonna give a shout out to Tony Schwery, and in this case, Tom Powles, who's a senior author and the team they put together, some really good people involved with this study. And I'll simply say that what you've got to understand is the eligibility criteria first, because you can't treat everybody. All right, there was very specific eligibility criteria. And first of all, these are clear cell components. They were, they were not the papillaries, they were not the chromophobes. These are clear cell components, so you could have some sarcomatoid variation. So, the protocol defined criteria for high risk was stage two with a nuclear grade four or sarcomatoid differentiation, tumor stage three or higher, regional lymph node mets, M1 but resected, so metastatic disease fully resected, and all these patients had to have a partial radical nephrectomy or metastectomy with negative surgical margins within 12 weeks for randomization. So everybody had the surgery, and then it's really the follow-up in the classification. And here's one of the punchlines. One of the punchlines is disease-free survival. And here you can see the reduction by about 32%. If you look at the benefit that was present in the follow-up, there was an ASCO-GU abstract presented this year in San Francisco. Tony Schwery did that. And the benefit was maintained. Here the hazard ratio dropped a little bit down to 0.63, but good confidence intervals, really no doubt about the statistical significance. Overall survival. Now, first of all, let me make an important note. Overall survival is very, very, very immature. We're looking at 18 versus 33 deaths. And this is out of a trial that enrolled, you know, almost a thousand patients. So these are very immature, but nevertheless, the curves are starting to split. 
and again, updated at ASCO GU 2022, the overall survival hazard ratio was 0.52, again, maintaining statistical significance. So these are important new studies and offer the potential benefit for an adjuvant therapy, and that is, I think, a game changer. This is something that should be discussed with patients when they fit the appropriate criteria. Now, there have been adjuvant trials done before, and some of them look positive, like this one. This is sunitinib trial with the S-TRAC trial, and this was presented in the New England Journal, and what you see is a median disease-free survival improved more than one year. So the median improvement in disease-free survival more than one year is one of the questions we had. But when you start looking at the overall survival, absolutely no benefit. And there's some quality of life issues that, that were significant. So with a PIMBRO, you have the disease-free and you have the overall survival early was statistically significant. Here you had the RPFS or the, the, the recurrence risk for sunitinib, but did not have any overall survival benefit. Now what about surgical issues of metastatic disease? And we've had a lot of discussion over the years about resecting the primary. Resecting the metastases are doing both. Now, please remember that in my mind, when you can reduce the disease burden in a substantial way, you're probably going to benefit the patient. But it has to be done in the context of risk stratification. If you take somebody who's a very high-risk patient and is destined to do relatively poorly, we don't really have solid data that in today's era that a nephrectomy in that setting is going to be helpful. And of course, you can't resect in these very high-risk patients. The metastatic disease could typically have multiple areas of metastases. But here's the risk stratification in metastatic renal cell two major classifications, one called the HING or often the international, and MSKCC. And you can see things that are important. Karnofsky performance status, hemoglobin, calcium, time from diagnosis to treatment, LDH, platelet count, and neutrophils, but not overall white count. And you can see that when you begin to total up these individual components, if you have zero components for the scale, then using that scale that you are going to be favorable risk. If you have one or two risk factors, you're intermediate. If you have greater than two, then you're going to be poor. Does it make a difference? And the answer is absolutely it makes a difference. So this risk stratification and outcomes, this is from the Hing article. It's an older article, but we still use it because it really is good. Look at those poor risk patients. My goodness gracious. You know, that's a terrible survival. Now, we're doing much, much better today, but the favorable guys are going to be doing so much better than the poor. So this risk stratification is important. It can also help to guide cytoreductive nephrectomy. In the cytokine era, we had two large studies that established the role of the cytoreductive nephrectomy. That's why I got in the RTC study. Both of them showed benefit. But remember, the cytokine era, that's a long, long, long time ago. In the TKI era... There was a Carmina trial that showed, quote, no benefit from surgery, but there's a lot of nuance there, and there were a lot of things that didn't happen properly in that trial. And then there's the International Consortium database, database that supported surgery for favorable intermediate, but not the poor risk patients, and you have to have a good performance status. In my opinion, I don't think there's a benefit if you've got a short survival expectancy. The patients with a relatively low volume disease, this favorable intermediate risk disease, I think you could consider for nephrectomy, and particularly those that have a good surgical risk. You know, you're probably not going to do it on a 99 year old, but your younger patients, favorable and intermediate risk, consider the nephrectomy because there is the real potential for benefit in that setting. What about metastectomy? I think if you have a single metastatic site, Take them both out. Do what you can. Remove all the tumor if you can. I even am more aggressive than that. Resect all the metastases if they're resectable. I think if you can render the patient free of disease and get them down to an M1 NED, no evidence disease, well, then you might have an adjuvant PIMBRO patient, right? And if you can reduce the burden of disease by 90% or more, then strongly consider aggressive surgery and select the patients with a good comorbidity status. I think it's very reasonable to do surgery on these patients. 
Now, one of the things that's a little bit interesting and new is understanding metastatic disease. And one of the things that is coming is new molecular imaging. This is with the, the, ant, the antibody directed to CA9, and the antibody is zirconium-89 labeled gerontuximab, and this may redefine the approaches to renal cell for staging and treatment. On the left-hand side, you see the CT. On the right-hand side, you see the, the PET scan. And what you see is an adrenal nodule and the renal nodule, and those were perhaps expected based on the CAT scan, but guess what showed up as a surprise? You've got a bony metastasis that was not detected with other methods of imaging. And I'll simply say that as we get better imaging, just like PSMA PET for prostate cancer, this better imaging, I think, is going to translate into the detection of metastatic disease in a manner that we would not have otherwise appreciated. I think that has significant implications. Now, drug treatment for renal cell. I cannot possibly cover all the studies that have been done. It's okay, I don't have to. A lot of these studies are now considered to be obsolete. We have, if you categorize the drug treatments, seven different categories. Cytokines, particularly the interferons, old school, really don't use them. And looking two is interesting, but hardly ever used today. High dose interleukin-2 does have a substantial benefit in a subset of patients, maybe about 8%. I'm not exactly sure who they are, by the way, but I can simply say that in a small percentage of patients, it can have meaningful benefit, but we haven't used it in some period of time because we have better therapies. The TKIs, and all of these are VEGF receptor and more, and we have serafinib, sunitinib, pizopinib, exitinib, levatinib, and cabozantinib. You know, all, all of these are appropriate therapies, but to some extent, we've moved on from using TKI monotherapy, particularly in the upfront setting. Anti-VEGF, like bevacizumab, approved but no longer really used. mTOR inhibitors, second line perhaps, everolimus, timsolimus. PD-1 inhibitors, yes. Nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and then the CTLA-4 inhibitors, ipilimumab, have also started to play a role in certain settings. There's a new FDA approval as of last year using an anti-HIF-2-alpha drug called belzutifan. But interestingly, FDA approved for non-metastatic BHL-associated tumors, so not a metastatic disease. The belzutifan is now in a variety of clinical trials for advanced disease patients, but none of these have read out yet. None of the big trials have read out, so we're not going to claim anything about belzutifan other than the fact that it's under study. Now, a few important comparative studies. If we want to look at kind of big four studies, if you will, we have the Checkmate 214, Keynote 426, Checkmate 9ER, and the CLEAR study. And these are going to be looking at Ipinevo, uh, Axitinib Pimbro, Cabozantinib Nevo, and Linvatinib Pimbro. Okay, so what you can see on the right hand side is a TKI plus a PD 1 inhibitor. And then you see the ipinevo, which is CTLA-4 inhibition combined with PD-1 inhibition. And I'm obviously not going to go through this in great detail, but I'm going to simply say that all of these are winning strategies. If we go to the, whoops, that would have just happened, but now we're doing better. Okay, so this is what I'm going to call ipinevo versus sunitinib, the TKI, kind of the standard TKI. Checkmate 214. And this was actually FDA approved all the way back in 2018. We're not looking at radiographic progression-free survival. We're looking at overall survival, people living longer. Has a ratio of 0 0.63, and this is held up. You know, these patients are going to do better when treated with, with the ipinevo combination as opposed to sunitinib. And furthermore, interestingly, there was quality of life improvement. The sunitinib patients had worse health-related quality of life as compared to the ipinevo in this frontline metastatic setting. Then we have the pembrolizumab exitinib trial, again versus sunitinib, the standard at the time, 
first five metastatic renal cell, again, an FDA approval, very good overall survival, hazard ratio 0 0.53. That's strong. That's, I mean, reducing the risk of death by almost half, 47%. That's really good data. And a lot of people have been using this particular regimen. Oh, but people have been using this regimen as well, also with a TKI and a PD-1 inhibitor, but in this case, nivolumab instead of Pimbro and cabozantinib instead of exitinib, again, versus sunitinib. And here you can see the hazard ratio is 0 0.60, 40% reduction in the risk of death as compared to sunitinib and also an FDA-approved trial, so important. Then we have the more recent one, and that's linvatinib, pembrolizumab. And the linvatinib, here you can see, was part of a three-arm study with linvatinib and pembrolizumab doing the best. The hazard ratio here was 0 0.66, and this is going against sunitinib, but also linvatinib everolimus, and the linvatinib everolimus was not a winner, so we don't use that. Instead, we use the linvatinib and pembrolizumab and this is also FDA approved last year. For second line studies, you know, we now have a bit of a conundrum. If you're using your TKI and your immunotherapy up front, you know, what do you do in the second line setting? I'll simply say a lot of studies addressing this, but still a bit of a controversy. In the older era, if you started looking at nivolumab versus ibrolimus, which ibrolimus being at the time the appropriate control arm, then it turns out that the nivolumab is better. And if you look at cabozantinib versus everolimus in the second line setting, and this is post-TKI, that you do better with the cabozantinib. So you have better trials if you have a TKI first and then progress with the cabozantinib. But at the same time, we still have some controversy if you've gone on something like exitinib and pibrolizumab and first line and levantinib Pembrolizumab and first line. Now, I haven't talked a lot about adverse events, but they're important. And of course, in a 30 minute talk, I can't really give all the emphasis I should to everything. But I will simply say that the immunotherapies can have significant effects, and there are a whole bunch of them, most of them relatively rare. Thyroid dysfunction is, is among the most common, and the potential for diarrhea and colitis are also relatively common. But then you have everything from nephritis to hepatitis to rare carditis, hypophysitis, and more. So if you're using the immunotherapies, you really have to monitor the patients. You really have to see the patients. You can't just give the drug and forget about them. They have significant IO-related side effects and a substantial number of patients. If you're using TKIs, they're going to have potential for hand-foot syndromes. They may have mucositis. They may have fatigue. They may have problems with liver functions, et cetera, et cetera. You have to know your drugs and know how to monitor and handle the side effects. Now, non-clear cells. Well, the non-clear cells, there are a lot of them, and we have trials that address some of them. We don't have big individual trials addressing all the rare tumors. It's just not going to happen. But one of the things that came out, and this was in advanced papillary, a fairly good size open-label phase two looking at cabozantinib, crizotinib, and sevolitinib, really turned out that the PFS was better with cabozantinib. And that was better than the sunitinib. And the sevolitinib and the crizotinib really did not improve very much. So this is going to say that cabozantinib is a reasonable approach for these papillary renal cells. And then the Keno 427 was looking at a variety of non-clear cell cancers, and you can see it's a non-clear cell cohort with 165 patients. That's a pretty good group of patients. Here they're getting Pembro, the older, I say older, 200 milligrams, Q3 weeks. We're typically using the 600 milligrams um, uh, now instead of the 300 milligrams, and we can give that Q6. And here's the waterfall plot, and it's a mixture of papillaries, chromophobes, and unclassified. And a lot of these patients that you see with good responders are actually the papillaries. And these patients can do well with an I.O., and oftentimes we try. But what about the I.O.-TKI combination? And that's now come out with nivolumab and cabozantinib and non cell. And this is waterfall plot for shrinking tumors. You can see that's pretty good. 
Now you've got a lot of papillaries in there. A few translocations are unclassified. But nevertheless, you know, now we're sort of bringing this TKI combination with IO to these non-queer cells, and some of them are doing pretty well. So I'm now going to summarize. I'm going to say that adjuvant therapy with pembrolizumab provides a new standard of care, and that's important. You need to be aware of that in the context of the appropriate patient. I know there's a lot of talk about risk stratification and who really benefits. I think we need to have more data before we're definitive on that point. I'm using the inclusion criteria that was done in the adjuvant PIBRO trial as a good guideline, but I think the higher the risk, the more the potential benefit. Those patients who have T2 lesions and non sarcomatoid you know, well, we're not sure if they're going to benefit, but we need to do more studies and look at this risk stratification in more detail. I'm aggressive with surgeries and metastectomies, particularly in the patients with favorable intermediate risk. I think there's impressive data on metastatic queer cell on multiple fronts, but I think the new standards of care are either going to be the PD-1 TKI combos or using the PD-1 CTLA-4 combination. And both of those are good. We don't have comparative studies there, but we really are having these patients live longer and longer and longer. And by the way, sometimes they have oligoprogression, and there you might have the use of a metastectomy or maybe an SBRT occurring at a later point in time when there's oligoprogressive disease. We see that in prostate, but even in renal, we're seeing it now as well. I typically use a PD-1 as a second-line choice for queer cell in those who had previously TKI-treated uh, patients, or cabazatinib for those previously treated with IO. The third-line choice is just not so clear. Clinical trials are appropriate. And I think these combination of TKI combos with the anti-PD-1 are appropriate for many of the non-queer cells. And with that, I've given you a quick overview of advanced renal cell. Hope you enjoyed it a bit. And then we turn it over to Ben, who's our next speaker. Or do I take questions, if there are any questions now? I'm I think sure. we have time. Uh, if there are questions from the audience, if you come up uh, to the microphone, we have uh, um, some time for some Q&A. Oliver, I had a question. Yep. Um, in terms of um, the imaging that you described, the Meckler imaging with um, carbonic anhydrase 9, yep. uh, when do you think that'll be clinically available? It, it yeah, you know, so I'm not completely clear, clear when that'll be. So the, the trial was actually looking at the non-definitive renal masses. So within the context of renal masses that are not really completely clear, the gertuximab is being utilized, and that's going to be submitted to the FDA. Exactly when there will be results, I'm not sure. I haven't seen the total results yet, but I will say that you can image with this really quite effectively. The oligomets, and I showed an oligomet case because I wanted to make the point about molecular imaging finding more than what you might have anticipated. It's a really important point. That is not going to be part of the initial indication. That is not how the trial was designed. So it's sort of in these indeterminate renal cell masses that if they're going to light up, then it's going to be definitive. And this is looking at queer cell because the C9 is particularly a queer cell component. It will not image non-queer cell. But exact timing, wish I knew. I have a question. Yeah. Use the microphone. There is definitive data now on Pembro for adjuvant uh, treatment of uh, renal cell cancer. Have, are there any trials using Nevo AP or carbazantinib or any of the other, other drugs for adjuvant uh, therapy? I, you know, I have not seen an AP. Or Nevo, neoadjuvant. Uh, uh, um, neoadjuvant, there are a variety of trials, but I haven't seen the phase three is going to change practice. And I, in terms of the adjuvant, gosh, I hate to say, I haven't seen an uh, AP Nevo trial uh, in that setting. You're going to have more side effects with the AP, uh, particularly when you start looking at colitis and other things. So the ipilimumab is more toxicity prone than is the nivolumab or PD-1. But um, I'm not quite sure about the new trials. Question at the mic. It's, so, it's suppose that you do not recommend a frontal nephrectomy, then we start the medication. If the patient has a very good response, like 70% of too much shrink and metastasis too. Would you recommend an nephrectomy after this or even metastasectomy in this set? The answer is likely yes. And, you know, this is an evolving paradigm. 
for the patients who are kind of converted, if you will, from a poor risk to a better risk because of the response to these therapies, we then begin to think about the residual disease. And it's a getting out in front of the curve to say that we recommend it, we don't have level one evidence. But let's put it this way, it definitely can be considered, particularly in those individuals who are left with a renal mass and may have a variety of metastatic disease that has essentially shrunk to nothing. You're dealing with a renal mass that is probably still active. This is where I think the genotuximab could potentially play an, an additional role, helping to define that, because you don't want to do always a bunch of biopsies. But um, this is going to be an evolving era. If, if you treat prostate, you know what PSMA PET is doing to our world right now. It's turning it upside down. I think molecular imaging here will play a role, but we have so much more to learn. Great. Well, thank you so much, Al. Great. Thank you, man. If we could bring up the next set of slides. So this, in the second um, format, uh, we will have a um, series of case presentation and, um, and management, and I'm gonna query our, our panel here as to various options for, for management. So case one is an 80-year-old male who um, uh, back in uh, 2012 presented to his cardiologist with back pain and shortness of breath, and underwent a CT scan demonstrating um, a left renal mass and a lytic lesion of the left iliac crest. He had some significant um, cardiac co comorbidities, uh, including um, CHF, a previous history of myocardial infarction, uh, and the rest of his uh, past medical history seen here. CT scan imaging demonstrated um, these two areas, both um, the uh, lower pole of the kidney, as well as a fairly large lytic lesion invading um, the left anterior iliac crest. And here's the axial view here as well as the axial view of the, um, of the iliac crest. So the question, um, maybe we start with Oliver, um, in terms of what would you do? Would you do a percutaneous biopsy of the kidney, a percutaneous biopsy of the iliac mass, radiation to the iliac bone, resection of the iliac bone, nephron sparing surgery, or radical nephrectomy? You know, I, I, I want to know what we're dealing with. And in this case, that iliac mass is so proximal I mean, that can be needled with virtually no comorbidity. I'd probably go for the iliac mass and make the assumption that whatever's in the kidney is also there. And it, it, that's exactly uh, the, the same question that, uh, that we had, because certainly a clear cell histology and a non-clear histology would want to be um, uh, confirmed. And so a percutaneous biopsy of the iliac lesion did, in fact, confirm metastatic renal cell, clear cell histology. And we discussed the role of both nephron sparing surgery in the setting of metastatic disease. Um, the patient had embolization of the iliac met and then underwent a multidisciplinary uh, procedure um, involving both uh, orthopedics, urology, and surgery, where an aggressive hemipelvectomy was performed together with um, a, a nephron sparing surgery. And one can see here the, um, on the KUB in the upper right hand corner that, in fact, um, a very aggressive resection of that left hip uh, was performed together with a, um, a partial nephrectomy. The final pathology did confirm a 6.2 centimeter T4 uh, uh, disease. It had invaded beyond Rhoda's fascia with negative margins, and the, iliac, um, the ilium, iliac specimen was in fact positive um, for, um, for metastatic disease as well. And so in follow-up imaging, uh, it was overall was stable. There's some scattered uh, pulmonary nodules, all less than a centimeter. Um, there's no evidence of, of local recurrence, and there was a small area in the left kidney measuring a centimeter that one can see here, and we elected to have um, active surveillance um, for that area. Um, and can see here um, the, the axial view um, lower down in the abdomen. So uh, in, um, in follow-up imaging, uh, this was a multidisciplinary follow-up with both urology and oncology. Four years uh, um, later, there was no evidence of uh, metastasis or recurrence. There was no adjuvant therapy at the time. However, in December of 2016, 
There was a CT that demonstrated an enlarging renal mass that was concerning um, for, a, uh, for a local recurrence. And even further, if one looks at the renal vein, um, you can see a thrombus in the renal vein right where, uh, proximal to where the gonadal vein uh, takeoff is on the caudal aspect, but certainly um, uh, did not extend all the way to the, uh, to the IVC. And so um, the MRI at this point um, that had demonstrated um, a recurrent tumor, now 1.9 by 1.7 centimeters, the renal vein thrombus, and then an enlarging 1.5 centimeter left adrenal nodule that was concerning um, for metastasis. And so, uh, Dr. Sundaram, uh, the options at this point in terms of management, um, would one um, give uh, a TKI plus immunotherapy versus immunotherapy, a left completion nephrectomy plus adrenalectomy, um, continued surveillance, or adrenal hormonal function tests? It, it depends on the patient's uh, general uh, comorbidities and how healthy he is. Uh, usually, uh, IV uh, uh, renal vein thrombus does not uh, respond very well to systemic therapy, but I would have the discussion with the patient and the, the medical oncologist about first trying systemic therapy first before embarking on surgery in an 80-year-old who, who is, uh, could, could have significant complication risk. And in terms of the adrenal mass, um, would you be concerned that this could be potentially be hormonally functioning? And if so, um, what tests would you want to screen uh, an adrenal mass, uh, if any, versus metastasis, uh, a metastasis to the adrenal gland from the kidney? You know, the usual functioning adrenal nodule mass is usual. It's going to develop over a much longer period of time. You have serial imaging here. I'm going to be assuming it's, it's uh, the queer cell. I don't think I would work him up for an adrenal mass. I'd assume it's, it's queer cell. But it's, it, it's interesting. He said he would talk to the medical oncologist. I would talk to the surgeon. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we're, we're looking at this, and, and I worry about, you know, the age and comorbidity of the patient. He already told me he has congestive heart failure, but he already went through a big-time surgery. But that was years with ago. That, with, that with, was years ago. It, it was some years ago. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at you and say, okay, should, can we get rid of it now yeah. and just make it go away? Now, as a commentary... If the patient came in today and had that resection, the nephrectomy, and the iliac lytic lesion both gone, that would have been the M1 no evidence disease pembroadjuvant right. therapy. So today would have been treated with that pembroadjuvant therapy, but of course back then we didn't have it. It really is uh, interesting how quickly the, the management has changed in, in real time. Uh, as new FDA treatments keep coming out year after year, the management certainly has, has changed. And so, so the concern was that this um, may have been a metastatic lesion um, to the adrenal gland. Taken in isolation, size um, greater than four centimeters, one would be concerned for a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. Less than four centimeters, one would certainly want to be con um, make sure that there was not um, excess uh, hormone function um, of that adrenal gland, including a, a cortisol, uh, catecholamines, and aldosterone for hormonal function testing. And so that test was, um, was, it was negative for any hormonal activity, and the patient did undergo a left robotic laparoscopic completion radical nephrectomy as well as adrenalectomy and resection of the renal vein thrombus. And so looking at the video here, so just to orient uh, everyone, the patient's um, head is to the left, the feet are to the right. Um, this is the left side, so this is the gonadal vein that is being released here. The ar renal artery um, uh, has been uh, isolated. We're um, passing a vessel loop around the renal vein thrombus to, in order to milk it back. And, uh, um, as one can see here, putting a hemolock clip and then kind of elevating that with your left hand, one can in fact um, milk back the thrombus proximally so that one can then pass the GIA. We did use um, robotic ultrasound uh, to, to, to make sure that there was no involvement of the thrombus beyond where we had passed that vessel loop. The artery was taken first, now, um, and then the, the stapler is now passing uh, onto the, uh, the renal vein. Um, 
we're, we're very conscious. Uh, the primary reason for a GIA malfunction is if a, if a hemolock clip is incorporated um, within the jaws, one also wants to make sure that the distal aspect of the GIA passes um, beyond the, the, uh, the vein, and so then uh, the bedside assistant fires the GIA, and then um, it is released. Now, interestingly, uh, many times um, uh, with the, um, the final pathology, uh, demonstrated uh, a six centimeter recurrent uh, clear cell, grade three out of four, invasion, invading the renal vein. Now, um, the GIA lays down six rows of staples and cuts between the third and fourth row, and oftentimes, um, whether it's an, an IVC thrombus or a renal vein thrombus, oftentimes they will say that the, the margin of the renal vein is involved. And because of the way that the, the, the um, resection and the ligation occurs, um, clinically, we confirmed with ultrasound and, and without taking another segment of vein, one can't uh, histologically um, and logistically, it's difficult to take another margin of the vein. And so oftentimes, uh, even though the, the, radio, the pathologist calls it a, 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 a vein margin, um, clinically, uh, we, we follow it uh, with imaging. Um, and the adrenal gland was benign in this case. I have a couple I, I, I'm amazed sure. at the negative adrenal. That, I mean, yes. that, that, was, that was a real adrenal mass. That wasn't yeah. fake. Yeah. yeah. I have a couple of comments. One is about the, uh, the positive renal vein margin. You're absolutely, uh, you are absolutely right. What I do in these cases is actually take out a little piece of the vein on the stay side and send it off for frozen section and permanent section to prevent this problem. Number two, number two, Oftentimes, when you have a renal vein thrombus just like this, there's not enough room to put in an endo-GI stapler. And with the robot, you can actually tie it with silk, the old-fashioned way. So you use much less vein to transect and control the vein. That's a really good point about the, um, the ability of the robot to use the, the silk. And do you put two silk ties exactly. or, or one? Two. Two, okay, exactly. good. Just like the old-fashioned way. It's nice, and that certainly um, saves uh, every millimeter counts um, with that margin. Switching gears now to a new case. Um, this is a 70-year-old Hispanic male with a history of clear cell renal cell carcinoma that was treated by partial nephrectomy uh, in April of 2018 by an outside institution, and at the time had been assessed as a T3A N0 M0. The final pathology demonstrated negative margins, but didn't have invasion into the renal vein. And uh, in 2018, um, medical oncology had started the patient adjuvant therapy, sinitinib. And the question is, um, is, this, is this reasonable treatment? And um, Oliver, what, what do you think about uh, starting the patient on um, sinitinib uh, with a history of uh, renal vein involvement on the final path. You, you know, I I would probably not. And and you know, these are the type of patients I think that can be followed closely. Um, I would certainly I would not have used it if I just didn't use it in the adjuvant setting. But but I think I'm more of a repeat imaging in this particular setting. Yeah, and I think with um, certainly conservative management and uh, the one would want to have demonstration of quantifiable disease. Um, probably before starting uh, any type of adjuvant therapy. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine really looking at snitinib um, was in the setting of metastatic uh, RCC uh, alone or after nephrectomy. Um, in, this page, in this case, uh, the medical oncologist had decided to, um, uh, and, and it, in the setting of adjuvant snitinib, <laughs> The meeting follow-up of 50 months in this, um, uh, in this uh, article, randomized nephrectomy and then sinitinib versus uh, sinitinib alone, and the median overall survival really didn't demonstrate a difference in response rate or progression rate um, survival. Um, and so, as uh, Dr. Sartor had, had mentioned in his earlier talk, there are a host of, uh, of adverse effects um, with um, sinitinib, um, including nausea, vomiting, hypertension, heart failure, et cetera. And so uh, in 2018, uh, the patient um, had, uh, was NED um, based on imaging, 
Um, they continued the adjuvant sunitinib uh, four weeks on and then two weeks off. Uh, there were some um, side effects of hypertension and lipase elevation, and so it was held and then restarted at a lower dose. And then uh, more recently, in January of this year, there was demonstrated a solid mass in the left posterior uh, perinephric uh, uh, space concerning for metastatic renal cell. And I'm going to see if, uh, um, if this will, if this video um, will play. Um, and you can see that the CT scan, if we can, um, I don't have a mouse that, uh, can you go ahead and click on that video? All right, I'm going to go to the next one, which may um, show it. And I wish I had a uh, cursor that could um, uh, stop this uh, uh, video. If you could pause it and then drag the uh, bottom bar um, to the right slowly, a little, little to the right. Keep going to the right. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You can see this area come into view right here. And you can pause right there. All right, so we're going to move on. Uh, again, if you could stop on the bar at the bottom and then drag it um, to, to the left slowly. Click on the bottom. Yeah, click on the bar on the bottom and drag it to the right now. There's the resection margin of the nephrectomy. Keep going to the right and back to the left here. So the area that um, was concerning as we come to the higher cuts. Right there, okay, hold on, stop right there, go to the right, with, drag a little bit to the right, is right there. So that's the area that was concerning for um, recurrent disease. We're going to advance now to the next um, video. And a PET scan had been done. If you could again click on the bottom and then drag to the right. And keep going to the right. And as we keep going to the right, you're going to see if we can click on the bottom again. And if we can go earlier, um, to drag it to the left now. You're going to see that the area um, that had corresponded on the MRI lights up on this, uh, on this PET scan. Coming Oops, into view. FTG PET. Yes. Yeah. As you likely know, they're often hit or miss. If they're positive, they're informative. If they're negative, you... Right. Yeah, it's a little less right. So we're going to... Um, uh, so at this point, um, uh, Chandru, would one change from a TKI to immunotherapy, do a percutaneous biopsy, continued active surveillance, or perform a robotic resection of the retroperitoneal mass? I would do a biopsy. And we agree. So I think that localization... The biopsy does... Um, uh, two things. It gives some confirmatory histology that this isn't simply inflammatory, uh, but at the same time uh, also helps to localize. And so this biopsy did come back positive for recurrent renal cell carcinoma. And this we did um, follow uh, Dr. Sartor's um, advice. If one can render the patient NED and resect that uh, that metastatic lesion, um, then that's what, uh, that's what we did. So um, I think the key to this step, um, given the, the, the desmoplastic reaction, using ultrasound to localize the mass um, is very important. Oftentimes going in on, on repeat surgery, um, you can have um, some really some significant scar tissue encapsulating. You can see that we're all the way down to the psoas muscle um, resecting it, and then the final specimen um, being identified here. We did send it for a frozen section to confirm that uh, the area in, um, was uh, the correct area that was resected. And the final path did come back metastatic RCC clear cell type, 
measuring five by four by 1.5 centimeters. And so I do think that um, in the setting of a solitary metastasis, the goal is to get all the tumor burden out. And I think that these cases can be done um, robotically. It, it, is, it can be very challenging for localization. That's why I think ultrasound is important to help uh, with identifying the, uh, the tumor and then um, uh, confirming that the resection site is indeed the targeted area. Switching gears to, um, to our next case, um, this is a 53-year-old uh, uh, Caucasian female who presented with light, right lower quadrant abdominal pain, had a one-year uh, history of hematuria that previously had not been um, evaluated, no history of, of weight loss. This, um, uh, she did have um, excellent renal function with a GFR greater than 90 and a creatinine of, uh, of uh, 0.69. Uh, the uh, urine culture, interestingly, had both E. coli and Proteus, and the cytology was negative. Um, one can see here on this imaging a 10.9-centimeter uh, mass on the right kidney that um, involved both the lower pole and mid pole, uh, as well as a contralateral uh, um, T1B uh, left renal mass with atrophy of the left kidney and um, a staghorn calculus um, involving that left kidney as well. And we can um, scroll through this image uh, one more time to see both the, um, the right side there and the left side coming into view with the stone as well as atrophy of the upper pole of the left kidney. And so, at the, and here's the um, axial uh, MRI showing some atrophic um, upper pole uh, and the involvement of the tumor. So just to summarize, the CT scan had a 10.6 by 8.2 by 6.5 centimeter solid mass. The inferometry score was 11A. The left kidney had a staghorn calculus with upper pole hydronephrosis of the mid and upper pole, uh, 5.1 centimeter uh, mid pole solid mass with a nephrometry score of 10A. The chest CT was negative for metastatic disease and a renal scan to get some baseline function showed 40% function of the left and 60% um, function of the right kidney. And so um, Chandru, uh, a number of options are, are presented here. Um, one could uh, render the patient anephric with a bilateral nephrectomy, perform a right radical nephrectomy, perform a left partial nephrectomy, a partial um, on either side, percutaneous nephrolithotomy, biopsy, or neoadjuvant uh, tyrosine kinase downsizing. In patients like this, I would always do a biopsy, number one, to see what the cell type is. Occasionally, uh, I've even seen uh, oncocytomas look like this, though this is very, very unlikely. It's most likely a renal cell carcinoma, but knowing the cell type would help when, uh, when uh, discussing with our medical oncologists if it's going to uh, respond to any uh, neoadjuvant uh, systemic therapy. So that's what I would do first. And if the biopsy came back clear cell, Oliver, um, and one were, would choose a, a TKI, what, which TKI would you, um, which options would you give them? It, you know, that's a, it's a really interesting case. Um, we, we have really good data with the TKI and IO combos. And you know, if I could get away with it, if the insurance companies would let me get away with it, I would probably try to shrink it down with a TKI um, Pimbo combo or Nevo combo. And because you, you need to do something other than take both her kidneys out. I mean, you're gonna end up in a situation here where she's gonna go on dialysis if you don't have more nephron. So if I, I can, make your surgery easier, I'm gonna try, and we'll see what the insurance companies will let me get away with. So uh, just to review, I think one of the common themes that we've had during this presentation really is um, the role of, of renal biopsy in the guidelines. In 2017, reinforced that in the setting of hematologic, metastatic, inflammatory, infectious etiology, um, a, a percutaneous biopsy is, is recommended. It's not required for young, healthy patients, but mm -hmm. Those with a higher risk of post-op morbidity and mortality, and certainly in this situation with bilateral renal masses, 
um, or patient counseling and decision making that may change management, um, certainly that one would want to get the histology. I think having the assessment of the response for clear cell histology prior to starting a, a TKI is important. And so, um, so the, um, for the patient first, uh, um, was the infection was treated, um, underwent a percutaneous nephrolithotomy on the left to optimize renal function and clear the stone burden. After that procedure, the creatinine was 0.79 with a GFR of 85. Wow. The biopsy did confirm clear cell histology and then started on a, on a TKI. And so the, the question um, for you, Oliver, is how long would one give uh, a TKI and when would one re-image and which side, um, Chanju, right. would you address first? So, so at, 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 this, at this point, I would probably do serial imaging in order to understand the response. I'd probably try to take it to best response. Okay. And if, if the kidney is shrinking, or the masses are shrinking, I'm going to say, let me do more. And okay. if we reach a point of maximum response, I'm going to say, your turn. Okay. And so there, say there is uh, shrinkage, Chandru, which side would you tackle first? I would do the right side first. If, uh, if it shrinks adequately enough that I am uh, quite confident that I could do a partial nephrectomy on the right side, that's what I would do because that's the larger mass. Okay. That's a more pathological significant mass that would affect his uh, longevity. So it's really interesting um, that, uh, so the, the, the pros and cons of the right side, that if one has to do, so it's a large large mass and if one has to, go from a partial to a radical, then the contralateral left side is a smaller mass, um, and you may have some concern about progression of metastatic disease from that right-sided tumor. The, the contralateral argument would be that if one did the left side, the smaller T1B lesion uh, on the left, that um, perhaps one can have a remnant moiety that if you do um, have to do a radical on the right-hand side, that you still have some preservation of renal function um, on the left. And so, um, so we did initiate uh, a, a TKI, uh, pazopinib, in, in collaboration with, with medical oncology that resulted in a 30% reduction in size. And the right side um, decreased from 10.6 to 8.3. Um, and then the left side decreased from, from 5.1 to, to 4.2. And one can see that um, there is some, some dramatic reduction um, on the right-hand side, the, uh, away from the renal hilum and the renal vasculature, um, and the left side, which had um, abutted the collecting system, uh, upwards of three to four centimeters into the renal sinus, had some regression down to about um, just about a centimeter. And so um, we actually tackled the left side first. Um, this was a clear cell, 5.1 centimeters, confined to the kidney with negative margins, the GFR, um, postoperatively was 99 with a creatinine of 0.7, and then we staged the right side three months later. We did a, we did obtain a preoperative renal scan uh, that demonstrated 30% uh, on the left kidney and 70% on the right. Uh, the right side had uh, was 8.5 centimeters. It did extend focally into the perinephric fat, and so it was T3A, but the margins were negative. And at one year, um, her GFRs continued to be preserved at 94 uh, and with a renal function of 0.73. Mm -hmm. So we probably only have time for one more case, and this is a, a case of a, a cytoreductive nephrectomy. And um, if we could have our AV um, assistants again to click on the bottom bar and drag the bar um, to the left. There you go. So you can see the tumor on the, if you could drag the bar to the left, or we can go right to the video. So, um, so this is the left side. Um, you can see um, that the, the renal artery has, uh, has been isolated. There's some bulky lymphadenopathy. And as the GIA is, uh, is being fired, um, you'll see uh, an accessory left renal artery branch that um, comes into view that can be easily controlled um, with the bipolar. And so there's a, a, a small um, ar arterial bleeder there that is uh, um, coagulated with the, with the um, uh, fenestrated bipolar. And then as the um, second fire of the GIA 
comes across that, uh, that renal artery, we start a timer here um, because it's noted that as the um, GIA is, is being released, that there's some um, significant torrential arterial bleeding um, that, that occurs. So Chandru, what, what, would, um, what would go through your mind as an algorithm of, of things to try and how would address uh, um, the setting of arterial bleeding um, from the aorta during a, um, a cytoreductive nephrectomy? Yes, the first thing would be to get tamponade. So I would uh, put in a lap, and you have a lap already there, I think. So see if the tamponade would help uh, uh, before you can uh, sort of get prepared for bleeding, resuscitate the patient, and so forth. This is arterial bleeding, so you don't, uh, you, you don't want to waste too much of time uh, because you have a window of opportunity. If the tamponading does not help, then you would need to convert. So that's my first approach. Are there a series of, um, uh, w would you try um, to, how it, after getting control and tamponade of that artery, how would you try and then control I, uh, now, afterwards, uh, secondarily? Tamponade, get uh, blood in, get uh, uh, the patient resuscitated as long as things are uh, uh, under control, then try to assess, uh, gradually take off the tamponade and see where the bleeding is coming from. Oftentimes, you know, you, it'll just be one artery that you can actually get a clip on. If you cannot get that, then you can even suture it with some proline. So it all depends on the situation. Uh, can you do it or can you, can you not do it? And if the answer is at that point, you then assess, uh, can I do it or not? If you cannot do it, then convert. Have a, have a fourth arm on it and, and uh, to control it, why it's to convert. So just as Dr. Sandaram has had suggested, getting control and tamponade with that left hand, um, control was obtained to get the stump of that, uh, that renal artery. A clip was first attempted, and uh, the bedside, this really is important, how the bedside assistant needs to um, work in concert um, with the team. And so the, the tissue um, posterior to the renal stump does need to be cleared in order for the hemolock clip to uh, um, to get control to get to close, and so the first clip was unsuccessful. The second clip was unsuccessful. It probably isn't a good idea to try and take off the hemolock clip with the scissors, and so a catier was um, exchanged for those scissors, and the clip that um, hadn't closed was um, obtained out of the uh, was moved out of the way. Um, a GAA stapler was attempted to pass, but there really wasn't enough length on that um, renal artery stump to be able to pass the GIA underneath the hand. And so, um, as was suggested, a, a proline stitch was then um, used. And so we call this a rescue stitch, where essentially a 4-0 proline uh, with a laparotide at the end is placed that allows one to essentially um, uh, do a baseball stitch and control. Now, because the fourth arm is lifting up the kidney, the left arm is on that renal artery stump, there's actually um, only one hand free. And so, again, working in concert with your bedside assistant, um, the bedside assistant passed a laparoscopic needle drive in order to follow and keep um, tension on that uh, renal artery stump. And then this was able to be suture ligated um, and then um, to avoid uh, having to convert um, at, the, uh, at the end of the day. And so just to finish up, uh, the technique of, of hemostasis is, um, with arterial bleeding is very different um, than that of venous bleeding. Um, getting first mechanical compression with a non-traumatic clamp or a mini lap and getting control is, is, is important and primary. Um, exposure, whether you need to add another five millimeter trocar, um, for retraction to allow um, introduction of the suction from uh, another angle um, is important. Um, first, starting a clip uh, is, um, is, is reasonable, but also having in mind that a rescue stitch with a 4-0 proline cut about six inches, um, uh, it may be a backup plan as well. Whenever we're dissecting um, on the vena cava or along the aorta, we do have this rescue stitch prepared. And certainly if one is able to, unable to control bleeding, I think communication with 
um, anesthesia colleagues to be able to um, uh, have the option to convert to open immediately is a, a last-ditch effort. So with that, um, that brings uh, this second section um, to a close, and we're gonna switch gears now to Dr. Chandra Sundaram's talk to um, present some challenging cases um, uh, for our third portion of the course. Thank you, Pam. So can you bring up my uh, talk, please? It should be there, that's the one. I've got lots of cases. In fact, I pared this down. And as I had uh, spoken to Dr. Sartor uh, just now, I learned so much from him every time we, I listened to him speak. Uh, because renal cancer is a fascinating uh, disease. And there are so many different options, a close collaboration with, with a medical oncologist who's knowledgeable in all these trials and has multiple options is critical uh, to ensure that we uh, treat our patients well. So let's go on to, I've selected these cases to demonstrate specific management issues with each one of them. So let's, I have, okay. I have no disclosure, so we'll get on with our first case. Uh, this is a 65-year-old with gross hematuria with a uh, 11 centimeter left renal mass and hilar lymphadenopathy. Uh, his creatinine was normal. He does have some comorbidities, it is on pl Plavix. So can you uh, run the video, please? So that's the mass in the left kidney. occupying almost the entire left kidney. And this is, uh, can you run this too? So that was the a large mass in the left kidney so he underwent a biopsy that showed clear cell renal cell carcinoma on the left side. Uh, as you, you saw, this man had multiple comorbidities. We proceeded with a left robotic radical nephrectomy with lymph node dissection. Um, that was the pathology. Grade three clear cell renal cell carcinoma with tumor necrosis present, and none of the lymph nodes were positive despite uh, extensive lymph node dissection. The reason why I put this in was, what is the role for a lymph node dissection for renal cell carcinoma? Uh, ben? Yeah, I would say that we don't routinely do a lymph node dissection unless preoperative imaging demonstrates um, concerning lesions, and I think that uh, um, if one um, does um, see a significant um, lymph node enlargement, then we would try to dissect it in that situation. Yeah. So typically, what, uh, there, uh, there was some data from Mayo Clinic several years ago for patients with large renal masses, especially if this, there is some necrosis, and if you have a biopsy that shows high-grade uh, renal cell carcinoma, it's reasonable to do a lymph node dissection. Dr. Sartor, any opinion on lymph node dissection? Would it help you in any way? You know, for risk stratification for adjuvant, it, it could be, you know, because that would upstage to an extent that the uh, indications for adjuvant be more clear. But, you know, what you've done here is 13 lymph nodes and none are involved. Exactly. Um, you do have tumor necrosis present, and you've got a reasonably high-grade tumor, uh, pathologic T3A, but the margins are negative. Correct. So, I mean, good surgery. Uh, so what about adjuvant therapy in these cases, in view of what you just told yeah. us about Pembro? Yeah, and I, I think the consideration for the pembrolizumab under these circumstances, resected tumor, uh, here you, you're running um, a, we don't have any sarcomatoid differentiation, we don't have any lymph nodes, but we do have a pathologic T3. It's a good-sized tumor when yes. I looked at it, and I would think that appropriate use of pembrolizumab could be done here. Thank you. So that's what we talked. Let's go to the next case. This was a 35-year-old woman with an incidental eight centimeter right renal mass in her first trimester of pregnancy. She had some pain, they did an ultrasound as part of the uh, pregnancy, found this mass, 
The patient had a previous history of uh, pulmonary embolism and was on uh, antiplatelet agents, and her creatinine was normal. Can we run this, please? So that was the mass of the right kidney, a fairly large central mass, and, the, and that is the gravid uterus right there at the bottom. Next slide. Can you run that, please? That's the same thing. And this one, too? Yeah, we did an MRI, and they uh, are fairly, uh, these cuts don't show it, but you could see the baby quite well there. <laughs> I've never seen an MRI for a fetus <laughs> before. But in any event, so there was this large mass. So my question to Dr. Uh, ben Lee is, what would you do? First trimester, large mass in the right kidney. We, we generally would try and, and get the fetus to term. Um, I think that uh, certainly the, the, um, the risk of, of to the fetus with anesthesia and certainly um, with the new peritoneum is going to be greater in the first trimester. Um, and so generally, and, and one needs to balance certainly the, the metastatic risk, um, but we would generally try and let exactly. the, the and mother go to term. And that's exactly what we did. And the reason why I put this in is this was a pregnant lady, which is not commonly seen, but in these really old, infirm patients with multiple comorbidities, just not T1, but maybe even selected patients that T1Bs could be observed uh, as long as you're careful about it. It's all about weighing the pros and cons of surgery versus no surgery and working with your medical oncologist to see if systemic therapy is better than surgery. So I'm, going to, this is the, I'm not going to show you all these, but that's what we did. We went through the pregnancy and then did a right robotic radical nephrectomy. That was a pathology, chromophobe renal cell carcinoma with negative lymph nodes, negative margins, and the patient's doing well so far. So I put this in purely to show that in older, especially in 80s and 90s, I've got patients who are 90 years old, and then you don't know whether to observe these, they're not fit for systemic therapy, and they're not easy decisions. How do both of you manage these situations? You know, Serial imaging will give you a growth rate. And for those tumors that are relatively static, then observation can continue. For those tumors that are growing, well, then you start getting into a tough decision. You know, you've got these older patients, comorbidities, and, you know, it's a long discussion with uh, the surgeon. You know, maybe there's something uh, less than surgery that might be appropriate. Uh, for small lesions, you might be able to do a radiofrequency ablation. Um, you know, so it may take a multidisciplinary conference and good discussion. So if, not, the, if the tumor is static, though, leave it alone. And really. serial imaging can be very helpful. And another question for you. What about SBRT? There's some recent evidence that uh, SBRT is useful for smaller masses, not the, uh, large masses. Well, what's your experience on that? You know, we actually do have a little experience. In fact, is I just SBRT'd a guy with uh, oligoprogression uh, very recently, and so far he appears to be healing very well. You know, there's a bit of a, uh, I don't call it myth, but it is a, a sort of a saying that these tumors are relatively radio resistant. Well, that's to low dose radiation, and it's not going to be susceptible like seminoma. I mean, seminoma just melts if you, you know, let the radiation in the room. If you use SBRT and you start going, you know, maybe 10 gray times 5, you can stop almost anything. And the question is, is it safe? Uh, that's an appropriate discussion with the radiation oncologist. You know, sometimes there are loops of bowel that are coming around and getting awfully close. If you get a straight shot at it, SBRT could be an option. Uh, it would have to be done in the context of a good radiation therapy concept. And this is critical to know that SBRT can be used in selected yeah. uh, patients with renal cell carcinoma. I've had experiences where it's worked wonderfully well. I've had a couple of cases that actually have recurred and grown after SBRT, and then you're, uh, you're in a tough spot. But certainly that's something you should uh, look into. Any comments, Ben? I think um, in the setting, if... 
uh, for the small renal mass uh, with a patient with significant cardiac comorbidities, pulmonary embolus, uh, cardiac issues, um, cryoablation is another option that um, we found successful in these patients if there's um, growth, significant growth. I think it's harder in the T2 lesion because of the increased risk of, of hemorrhage with cracking of the ice ball, and, um, and really, in my mind, I try and limit um, cryo to, to four centimeters or less. Exactly, absolutely. Cryo has been around for many, many years. I used to do cryo laparoscopically many years ago. Now, percutaneous cryo is the way to go for small renal masses, especially if they're posterior and they're not good candidates for surgery. So, and just thank you, so that's up to a three centimeter. At what point would you not? Three centimeters. The three ideal centimeters. is three centimeter posterior oh, right. facing okay. mass. It's a no brainer, yes. Thank you. So, so a 35 year old man with end stage renal disease and a renal transplantation in 2005, uh, as well as a, a, a lymphoproliferative disease on rituximab, developed new back pain and found to have a 2.8 centimeter solid enhancing mass in the upper quadrant of the transplant kidney. The transplant kidney renal function was fantastic. Uh, 1.06 was, uh, was the creatinine. So let's run this video, please. So that's the uh, stop right there. You could see that you could all, all see that, right? Stop there, please. Yeah, right there, stop there. You can see the mass there in the anterior aspect of the, of the lower half of the uh, transplant kidney. The reason why I put this in is as we are seeing more and more of these patients on renal transplantation, transplantation, we do see kidney cancer in transplant kidneys. And that's something that we, in fact, we had one patient who was in India and they said, take the transplant kidney out. And the patient actually came from India to Indianapolis because he knew somebody there and uh, we did a partial nephrectomy. So the question here is, number one, the role of partial nephrectomy in transplant kidneys, remember that is the way to go if it's possible. And number two, what would you do it robotically or open? I've done it both ways. Let's get Dr. Lee's opinion on that. So I think uh, many times there's a desmoplastic, desmoplastic reaction around the transplant kidney and isolating the renal artery um, can be challenging. And so I would probably do this in conjunction with the transplant team uh, as an open uh, nephron sparing surgery approach. Um, we have um, had experience uh, in the robotic approach for transplant kidneys actually in the ureteral stricture area where the dissection is actually to identify the ureter um, uh, can be localized robotically with the use of indosocyanine green, but that's a different situation um, for strictures. For, uh, for tumor, we generally would probably go open in this situation. So I've done about eight or nine of these transplant partial nephrectomies. In fact, I've gone the other way around. I used to do it robotically and was very proud of myself that we could do it, but now I actually tend to do more open partial nephrectomies. I'll tell you why. Because with robotics, what I would end up doing is clamping the uh, renal artery and mass, and uh, oftentimes you cannot even see the renal artery. So I would uh, clamp the iliac arteries above and below the, uh, the kidney. And that's a big deal, especially in these transplant patients who can have atherosclerosis in these arteries. So now we do it open and uh, in conjunction with the transplant guys. So they help me uh, dissect out the kidney and what we do is we do it off clamp completely. Off clamp, enucleation for transplant uh, partial nephrectomies. It's worked really well uh, and uh, with no renography if, if possible. So it, it's worked well, but the bottom line is, remember partial nephrectomies is the way to go for these transplant kidneys. And then let's move on. So what about uh, for Dr. Sartor, what about patients with uh, kid, uh, kidney cancer, how long do you wait before they get a transplant? Suppose these are patients with kidney cancer, de novo, they are on dialysis, um, and they are waiting for renal transplantation. So would you wait for two years, five years, no waiting? What do you do? You know, our, our transplant team has guidance, and I would have to defer to them. So I would contact the transplant team and, and, and get their input. So they ask me for it, the input. So what do I do? You know, if, if you, I mean, that looked like a sub, it was less than three centimeters, that last one. I mean, yes. no, I'm sorry. I'm so, talking so, about a patient with uh, kidney cancer in the native kidney. 
Native kidney. No, Native, has real kidney. Native kidney. Yes. Yeah. And and so I mean the question is that if it's I mean it's resected I'm going to presume, and yeah. the, and the question is how big Long was view. it? How big was it in the first place? Let's say T1. T1 and T1 I'm fine to move ahead relatively exactly. quickly. Exactly. And if it's T3, Correct. then we're going to start talking about the adjuvant pimbro. Exactly. T2, it kind of depends on the other exactly. features. But T1, I think you can transplant. It's exactly what we do. And I think that's important to know that. Uh, yeah, and I, and I found that it's really institution um, specific, specific yeah. that uh, th there actually are very few universal guidelines in this area. So I'm glad that you bring up this point. In a T1 lesion, um, in a patient with end-stage renal disease, we would just do a, a, a robotic or laparoscopic radical nephrectomy. And then um, it, it actually, some won't wait at all and will immediately post. Some may recommend a year, um, but it's really institution specific. Yeah, so T1 low grade, we don't wait at all, and they, they're okay with that. Anything else is a discussion, but like Dr. Sartor said, if it's T3, that's a different matter. Two years is typically what we do. So this is a 59-year-old man with a history of bilateral renal masses, status post right radical nephrectomy in February 2021, clear cell T3A N0, and develops a left renal mass, uh, actually multiple left renal masses. I'll show you the CT scans in a minute. Uh, and there was a, and this was, this was a very difficult situation. This patient was an anesthesiologist, had underlying chronic kidney disease, had an ultrasound for the chronic kidney disease, and was found to have a huge mass on one side, multiple masses on the other side. And so the question is, what do we do? So the, on the side that the entire kidney was cons uh, consumed with cancer, we removed it. Now he has multiple small tumors on the left side, and what do we do? We biopsied it the, on, the, on the left side, and, it, and then we did elected to observe it because it was renal cell, clear cell renal cell carcinoma grade two. So let me show you the CAT scan now. Can you run this, please? So that was the, you can see the right kidney. Stop, stop right there, stop right there. The right kidney was just consumed completely with this very high, very uh, uh, hyperemic, uh, lots of neovascularity, almost looked like AV fistulas in there. Uh, and the left side, there were multiple masses. Can you run that again, please? So how, how would we manage this, uh, Dr. Sartor or Dr. Lee? So you know, interestingly, in this situation with, uh, and I see in that uh, in the past, on the left side, at least four or five, if not more, yes. um, small renal masses. Uh, the question is, is whether or not um, uh, this patient would test positive for von Hippel-Lindau or some uh, genetic predisposition for multifocal disease. I, I would agree um, the right side would be a radical nephrectomy and the left side um, would be a, an, a, a nucleation or Dr. Sarker is going to add another option. Well, well, no, no. I mean, I mean, you know. So, I mean, the VHL is a real possible. I mean, I'm worried about VHL. And could this be belzutifan? Could this be the indication for belzutifan? Yes. And the HIF2 alpha inhibitor. Um, I mean, this is a tough case. Yeah. And you know, I, I I'm I'm venturing into worlds that I don't know very well when it, when I would think about a somatic VHL. If it's clear cell. You know, the belzutifan is an absolutely active agent. And, you know, could that give you some reprieve? Could that keep him off dialysis? I mean, this guy's got a creatinine in 1.7. He's functioning off that tiny, uh, on, on the part of the left kidney that's not consumed with tumor. The right side's a disaster. And this is a tough case. Yeah. So what is your, Dr. Sartor, what is your indication for germline testing, genomic profiling in patients with kidney cancer? You know, I would have no hesitancy with a bilateral simultaneous pr presentation to be able to look at the bilaterality increases the probability. But I would run the germline genetics here. If we came up with a VHL, then you've got a path forward yeah. that might actually be able to help the patient. 
Yeah, this was clear cell. There was no VHL, unfortunately. Yeah. So, oh, and then, case. and then they did a biopsy. I've never seen this before. He had a recurrence from the tract, needle tract. They, they always oh, wow. say biopsies are benign, and they've never yeah. seen one. This guy had one. This guy had it. Had of course, it. he's a doctor. Exactly. Right. He's a physician. Exactly. exactly. Everything's going to so go. So rare on. things happen. So I'm going to. Do you know on. if they did a core biopsy they or a fine needle? Core. They did aspirin. a core biopsy. Okay. So he's now getting nivolumab, ipilimumab uh, right now, and we'll probably have to take his kidney and that uh, recurrence in the, in the, in the uh, psoas muscle out at some point. We are waiting for that. So this is a 60, how much time do we have? When should we stop? Because I can, we can go on forever. Yeah, uh, yeah do you have a good 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, yeah. so for, uh, 5.40 I'll stop. Sure. Um, so the, the, uh, this is a 63-year-old man with a solitary left kidney. Uh, and incidentally found to have a mass in the lower pole of the other kidney. So let's look at the CT scan. Can you run that, please? It's a solitary kidney with a large left renal mass. So the question for Dr. Sartor is, is there a room for downsizing with systemic treatment? We talked about that yeah. briefly earlier on, so this is, uh, we, we just talk about you, it a little you, again. You know, the, the, the rule that I have is that when you, as a surgeon, need some extra space and help, then we need to try to provide that help. How often do you see a reduction in size and how, how, how much? You know, it, it actually is probably the majority of cases that, mm -hmm. that we see the reduction. And some, some of these we can see, you know, 30%, 40%. Uh, and like I said, I try to use the serial assessments because I don't always know how far it's going to go. You know, there's always a straight line between two points. And if we have a baseline and I check one, I know where I am, but I have to make sure there's been adequate exposure and typically a minimum of three months. But the question also revolves around sort of the emergency of the situation. I did mention earlier something that I would try if the insurance companies would let me get away with it. I know that we get better responses, with, if, particularly with a queer cell on an IO TKI combo. I would try to push that because I'm going to get better shrinkage. Better shrinkage for me means better surgery for you. Correct. Means the cancer pa if the cancer patient has a better probability. I mean, you know. I think this is important for you all, especially if you can do a partial instead of a radical. Yeah. Uh, it's worthwhile doing. We just re we just reviewed our um, series um, in the last eight years of using uh, TKA downsizing, and in the last um, 20 patients, uh, 20 renal units, and have an average of about 35 percent reduction. And um, and similar to what um, Oliver had said, uh, the the TKA is generally give for given for three months and reimaged, and if there is um, reduction, uh, then it will. Um, either attempt the partial, if it's technically possible But there. you wouldn't do just TKIs now, would you, Dr. Sartre? Uh, you know, I, on the clear cells, I would actually try to use the combination of yeah. an IO and a TKI. Yeah. Okay. Now, the indications are for metastatic disease, and I may not be able to get away with it. No. Sometimes I look at the scan real, real hard and might see something that's a little bit suspicious, in which case it gives me a little more leeway. But you know, the, the, if you look at the partial response rate when you use the IO-TKI combo, it's higher than with TKI alone. Yeah. These are very important points for, for all of us to take home. Then there's a 51-year-old with an 8-centimeter left upper pole mass. Uh, MRI confirmed solid mass. The, this was a PET CT was done before the patient was sent to me and suggestive of renal cell carcinoma without metastasis. So this is the uh, image. I, I don't have a video for this, but I'll just scroll this. That's the image. So what do you do? For can, can we go through those images again? Let go back, please. I, I can go back. That's one. one. I don't have many more, but the patient had this ma a huge mass similar on the left side and also on the right side. So there is, so the cuts I saw were, um, I saw the mass more on the left kidney, yes, yes. Um, and without a coronal, Agreed. it's hard to assess whether or not it involves 
more than 50% of the, of the left kidney. So if, if I can preserve at least 50%, then This I one in, involved about 50% on the right side, or I'm sorry, I didn't, don't have those images. It was just a lower pole. Okay, so, so if I can preserve 50%, I'll do a partial nephrectomy. Okay. I think that more than 50% resection sets up the kidney for hyperfiltration injury, and in that situation, generally we do a radical. In the setting of, of now is this bilateral disease yes. then? Uh, then, uh, then I would um, consider uh, um, trying to do some downsizing. Okay, so now we've been using the Sestamy B spec CT scan for, uh, for a few years now after the experience from Hopkins, which suggests that they are fairly good to pick up these oncocytomas. So it lit up brightly on the Sestamy B scan, suggesting that this could be an oncocytoma. At that time, I did, would not uh, rely only on a Sestamy B scan. This was 2019. So we did a biopsy after this, and that also confirmed an oncocytoma. See, that was the mass there. And biopsy confirmed oncocytoma, so obviously we're not doing anything. So the, the, the point here is the uh, usefulness of Sestamy B scan in patients with renal masses. In fact, I have another patient with bilateral masses, same story. Um, so the issue is when do you do biopsies, when do you do a Sestamy B scan? I think both of these uh, have a role to play. Uh, I'm going to stop there since I've run out of time. Correct, Ben? So we've got one more talk? Uh, no, that's actually, you can do this last presentation and then maybe stop then. Okay, so we, we've got time to 6 o'clock? Right. Okay, so we can, I can keep going on then? Okay. Okay. So this is a 66-year-old with a solitary kidney, uh, and we'll talk about that. So this lady had a left nephrectomy in 1997 uh, for a 5.5-centimeter clear cell renal cell carcinoma. In 2013, she sees me with a, incidentally at that time, found two right renal masses, 3-centimeter and 4.5-centimeter. The reason why I bring this up is two reasons. One is... What is the follow-up for renal cell cancer? This patient in 77 had a left nephrectomy for 5.5 centimeter mass, and in 2013 she has two renal masses on the other, on the other side. So, Dr. Lee, how, off, how long would you follow patients with renal cell cancer? Yeah, yeah so, you know, the, at the initial imaging for a T1B initial left nephrectomy, the initial imaging would be at six months, and then one would space it out to annually. Now. Now, it's interesting because um, the, the thought process of five year after five years, the risk of, of recurrent disease goes down. But clearly, in this situation, uh, this, this patient with follow-up imaging had two additional lesions in the contralateral kidney. So, Dr. Sartor, you must see this all, all the time, right? I mean, patients who have lost a follow-up come back with met metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Yeah, so, but, what is your but, algorithm... Well, Long -term. I, I, I mean, I think, I think in some fairness, I don't know if this is just a secondary series exactly. of tumors or whether or not it may exactly. have been derived from the first. And, you know, I mean, we'll typically go out to about six years mm -hmm. or so. And, you know, as been stated, you know, once you get beyond six years, I mean, the, the instance of it's metastatic disease is extremely small. Exactly. You probably cut it off at five and I've stretched it to six yeah. perhaps. But... You know, here you've got sort of an unfortunate circumstance. I mean, goodness gracious, you know, 1997 to 2013. Exactly. That's 16 years. Exactly. That's a lot of years. Exactly. Exactly. So you wouldn't do this. You wouldn't follow patients for 16 years anyway. No, no I really wouldn't. But uh, beyond five years, it's uncharted territory, right? Most of the guidelines say after five years is based on physician discretion. Or, and that's what they leave it up. So my policy is if it's T1, grade 2, uh, T1A grade 2, I'd stop after five years. But anything beyond that, especially if it's high grade, I would space it out for imaging every two years instead of one year. Uh, and even switch to ultrasound, especially if it's high grade, it's T3 disease and st stuff like that. Yeah, so sort of, sort of the missing element here is you don't really tell us about what type of post-op imaging she actually had. Was, yeah. was she followed for five years with no evidence of recurrence? Yes. She was. Okay. Yes, she was. Yes. So let's move on to what happened after that. Can yeah, this, So this was, the, this was when she saw me in 2013. So there was one mass there, and then right below that there was another mass, almost like a dumbbell-shaped mass. So 
I did a robotic partial nephrectomy with both the uh, tumors being removed. So I started off trying to do an enucleation. This is an ideal situation for enucleation. I put this in uh, to, uh, to talk about enucleation. So Dr. Lee, what would you do? Enucleation versus the regular partial nephrectomy. I think with multifocal disease, I would try to do um, enucleation. And if, um, if there was not a deep depth of penetration, um, one can even try and do the soft clamp. I think the deeper, if it involves the budding in the collecting system, then generally you are going to have to clamp and try and limit to uh, um, less than 30 minutes. Um, and then certainly um, maybe perhaps um, foregoing the renorphy and just doing the deep layer um, may decrease some time for, um, for the ischemia time. Absolutely. All very good points, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, we've, I, I start off doing enucleation with no clamping at all, and then if uh, it starts bleeding uh, quite a bit, then clamp and then do just a single layer renorphy. And that's exactly what we did. But it doesn't end there. So the, this was the pathology, 4.5 centimeter Furman grade three renal cell carcinoma. We observe her, then she develops a pancreatic metastasis in 2000, two years later. So the, the, the general surgeons uh, uh, do a distal pancreatectomy, remove that. Then she develops in 2016, another renal mass in that right kidney. And I observed it till it got to three centimeters in size. And then what would you do, Dr. Lee? So uh, going back into that same um, space, uh, it's going to be difficult to dissect out the hymen. There may be some significant uh, adhesions. I think the options at this point would be either um, ablation, um, uh, either percutaneous ablation, um, given the fact that it's three centimeters, or uh, um, offer a robotic partial nephrectomy with the caveat that there, it may result in a, in a radical if um, there's significant bleeding, but, or um, do an, an enucleation of, of that tumor. Um, yeah, so all very good points, and the reason why I put this in is there is a role for open surgery, especially in patients like, like this, and that's what we did. We did an open partial, it was completely scarred down, it was an absolute disaster. So we did an open partial nephrectomy, and got that out. This was the mass that, can we run that? Uh, no, maybe not, okay. Th that, that was the mass right there. You can see that mass there, it was uh, endophytic mass. And then I waited until it got, got bigger and then did an open partial nephrectomy. So we, th so this lady had two partial nephrectomies on the right side, one robotic and then one open, and I still see her, she's disease free. And, uh, and then this is a, we've got time, so 27-year-old uh, with a right, uh, right abdominal pain. Patient has this 20-centimeter cystic mass uh, in the uh, right kidney. So let's run this, please. So that is the mass, cystic, large mass, 20 centimeters in size. So this is fairly cystic. So the question is, should we biopsy it? Should we remove it? Should we do it robotically? Should we do a radical nephrectomy? What do you say, Dr. Lee? You know, with the cystic lesion, um, the concern if, if one has a, uh, a percutaneous biopsy that the ability to get a, an adequate tissue sample um, may be an issue. Um, given it's 20 centimeters, we generally would, would favor radical nephrectomy. Correct. And I, that's exactly what I thought. Then the other concern for me is, do I do it open or robotic? If this was solid, then maybe I would have tried it robotically, but since it was cystic, I didn't want to risk rupturing the tumor uh, without, the lack, without any uh, tactile feedback of the robot. Uh, and so we did an open radical nephrectomy in this patient. Any comments, Dr. Sartre? No, I'm glad you're a good surgeon. <laughs> so so this, uh, can you run this, please? So fairly large uh, tumor, and I didn't want to mess uh, with a patient, especially, and not with, I don't want to mess any patient up, but this, uh, especially no. so at a 25-year-old. But, but she's 27. 27-year-old, yeah. Very, very young woman. Yeah. 
So, so interestingly, I, I wonder, um, just a question, um, was she Hispanic or Native American? No, not Native no. um, Because we've, we've done some work in our lab uh, at the University of Arizona that we've noticed that in renal cell carcinoma, in the, there's some um, racial disparity. So in the Hispanic population as well as the Native American population, we're seeing tumors um, earlier and earlier at a younger age and actually presenting with a more advanced stage and an earlier death rate. Um, and so um, it, it is astounding, 25 years old is quite young, um, and so we've started to now look at um, the genetics of the disease um, and have a, an R21 grant. For so that is a good question. So at what is the indication based on AUA or other guidelines for genetic testing in patients with renal cell carcinoma? Yeah, you know, we don't really have good guidelines right now except for sort of family history-driven, you know, guidelines. But I think in these very young patients with bilateral tumors, you need to think about it. But the cost of testing has gone down so much. I mean, the, the typical patient in our practice for genomic sequencing today is probably $125. And oftentimes, it, if it's not covered by insurance, the companies may even drop it down a little bit less. So you can do the genetic testing in a very cost-feasible cost sort of setting. But now I'm curious, what did she have? I didn't, I, I didn't, I, I didn't hear. Was it a clear cell? Or was it a? So it was a cystic clear cell. It was a cystic clear cell. Okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah. No, in fact, it was not. <laughs> this is what oh, it was. Translocation. <laughs> Sorry, it was a translocation. Wow. Yeah. So tell me about that. What is your experience with translocation? We looked at our translocation associated renal cell carcinoma. Obviously, the bigger ones have a poor progn poorer prognosis compared to yeah. clear cell. You, you know, so what's they, your experience? They have, they have a, in, in my opinion, a little better prognosis than you would get with, with a typical clear cell, but some of these patients do metastasize. I've got yeah. a physician, of course, who has metastatic translocation, and we've been managing her with TKIs for a long, long time, and she's gradually growing. We tried her on, on, on the IOs without any success. We've resected what we can resect, but unfortunately she continues to grow in a non-resectable way. Um, the, the simple thing is that these are tough cases once yeah. they spread, and they're not particularly responsive to our, to our usual agents. So in our experience, the smaller ones, they be, the prognosis is very much the same, where we do a partial nephrectomy. Yeah, if you, yeah, if you treat them surgically, treat exactly. them surgically. Yeah. Whereas the bigger ones are the problem. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about that. This is a. This is the last one. Okay, last one. So when do you want to stop? I can stop now. We can stop now. I'm um, making it just okay. two, two lines from up. Okay. okay. So 65 year old uh, patient with uh, incidental uh, mass in the pelvic right kidney the, with multiple comorbidities. So I can go through this quickly. There's a mass there in the lower half of the pelvic kidney did a robotic right partial nephrectomy in 2014. Then patient develops a recurrence in that same kidney, but on the opposite side, right there. You can see that right there. So, and let, we let it grow a little bit, and it gets a little ob more obvious there. And then the reason why I put this in is for a percutaneous cryoablation. So there was a small window there, very small window b below the, between the bowel and the bone. And our, uh, our radi uh, uh, radiation oncologist, our interventional radiologist was able to get a needle, a probe in there, and we ablated that. And, and the patient's been doing well. So the, the point is percutaneous cryoablation does have a role. Uh, to play in these small renal masses, especially in difficult circumstances. And I think in this situation, one can also um, have the interventional radiologist can um, hydrodissect and yes. inject some saline to push the bowel away. Um, you can see in the posterior aspect that it does actually come quite close, but uh, having that extra space of uh, safety um, certainly helps when the ice ball Absolutely. forms. I just put these in because I used to do this all the time. Every partial nephrectomy I did, I would section them just to see that they're not all the same. Some of them are smooth, like the one on the right. The ones on the left is a little bit more uh, lobulated with little nodules, with protrusions. So if you try to do an e-nucleation on the one on the right, on the left, you could run into trouble and have a positive margin. So you have to get a negative margin.
We look at this one, same thing. It's got lots of uh, sort of little fingers protruding out. And that's it. You said this should be the last one. This was the last one. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Dr. Sundaram, uh, and, and thank you t uh, as well, Dr. Sartor. Um, if there are no questions, um, I'd like to just thank uh, our esteemed faculty for um, their contribute, uh, contributions to um, educate um, everyone on certainly the, the context of high-risk renal cell carcinoma. The management keeps changing and changing, and to keep up with um, the, the rapid changing is, uh, is an annual event. Any questions from the audience? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, really, really challenging case. And just for those that are um, uh, listening on the on the live streaming, this is a, a, a patient that has both a, a five centimeter right lower pole renal mass, but also a concern of a liver lesion as well, and, and is currently um, being evaluated. So I would um, first uh, do a, um, uh, so you can cons consider doing a biopsy of that liver lesion to um, consider um, histology, but if it's the only area and amenable to a hepatic resection, then uh, a surgical oncologist can do the liver resection at the same time that um, the, uh, the right kidney is addressed. And if it's exophytic lower pole, then uh, nephron sparing surgery on the right side together with the hepatic resection if they feel it's amenable. You know, if, it, if it's clear cell, then you did the metastectomy, did the nephrectomy, did both. Adjuvant therapy would be very appropriate. Question in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I use... Uh, I use flow seal and surgery cell, but you could use virtually anything if you're doing an enucleation and just have a raw surface. For a typical partial nephrectomy, I don't use anything when I do a two layer renography, but when you're doing a no renography or a single layer renography, I always use uh, flow seal for sure, and sometimes surgery cell and flow seal, but there are lots of different options people use as long as you're comfortable with any seal and it's fine. Absolutely. So you have to ensure that there's no collecting system opening. Pardon? Yeah, I, I do. Do Lasix, uh, methylene blue, uh, and or ICG, depending on well, who, what, what you want to see. I, I do that. Absolutely. You must make sure that. Rarely, I even put up open-ended urethral catheters, maybe five percent of the time, or maybe two percent of the time to inject contrast from uh, retrograde to make sure that there's no leak. Any comments, Ben? So for the audience that's online, the question is with um, uh, downsizing of tumors, um, if one has a reduction in size at three months, um, why not continue uh, trying to downsize them even further? And I think that 
I think the goal of downsizing, um, you know, the tumor's never going to, I've never seen, at least not in my experience, I've never seen the tumor um, go away completely. And so the goal is to essentially try and optimize renal function and to try and optimize the surgical approach so that one can achieve nephron sparing surgery. Um, and that, that would be the goal. So when one no longer has a, uh, a reduction in size and, and it's plateaued, or if, then, or if one can assess that it is then technically feasible for nephron sparing surgery, that would be the indication to then um, transition from uh, the neoadjuvant therapy to surgical approach. I think what Ben just said is you're treating the surgeon. You want her to be able to treat the tumor till he's happy. <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Well, again, thank you, thank you um, to the audience and as well as thank you to the faculty. Evaluate.